Working Cows Podcast, Episode 49. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. It's Clay Connery back with another episode of the Working Cows Podcast. Today we are talking with Daniel Suarez. Daniel runs a website, Ganaderia Rehenateriva. It is a Spanish website, a Mexican website. He is from uh, southern Mexico in the Chiapas region. Um, very unique climate, unique challenges that he is facing there and uh, unique considerations and strategy that he is he's dealing with down there. So I wanted to invite him to talk just a little bit about um, how ranching is different in those places, but also how ranching is a lot the same in those places. So Daniel, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Hi Clay, thanks for inviting me to this beautiful podcast that you have set up. I'm a, a, a big fan of it. Keep, keep listening to it every Monday as I can always driving. I, I, I don't listen to music anymore. I listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand how that goes. It, it's once you, once you open up that Pandora's box of yes, podcasts, there's yes. just, you, you, there's no, there's no end to that wormhole. No. So <laughs> I'm, I'm there with you. If my kids and my wife aren't in the car with me, I'm listening to podcasts. So yes, absolutely. Mine too. Well, I appreciate your kind words. I appreciate your feedback. I appreciate you, uh, you know, sending me resources and different things throughout, uh, this journey that I've been on over the last year. Um, and I just think that the region that you're, that you're in, in ranching is probably a little bit foreign to most of the listeners of the working cows podcast we kind of take a swath right out of the middle of america from from south dakota and wyoming colorado uh kansas nebraska oklahoma texas those are kind of the top states as far as downloads and and most of those places are somewhere between between uh 10 and 30 inches of rain a year depending on the year and depending on uh, or moisture i guess some of that comes in the form of snow the farther north you get so um we i just like to talk to you about about kind of the challenges of of ranching where you do so if you'd tell me a little bit about your uh region and and the climate and some of those things maybe we can get started there okay just to point your 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 listeners in the map where i am i am in chiapas mexico all the way south of mexico in the is a state that uh, border with Guatemala, yeah, we have uh, we all people always think of Chiapas as a really really humid uh, state, humid uh, region. It has humid regions, but it has dry regions too, and this is where I am placed. I am placed in the center of Chiapas. I get a lot of rain. I get uh, fifteen hundred millimeters, around sixty inches. But I get them in four months. Yes, I am. I'm located. Uh, the ecosystem is um, dry tropics, so we get this lots of water in a really short period of time, and we have a really severe, severe dry season. You guys get all of most of your moisture in four months, and so what do you do for the rest of the year? What do you do for the other eight months out of the year? How are you guys managing so that you're able to uh, make use of grass while it's growing and then also have some grass when when it's not getting rain on it the strategies to go through the through the dry season there are a lot and you have to decide which to use depending on your risks too for example i cannot uh, make hay quali high quality hay during the dry during the rainy season because my soil my soil doesn't allow me to to go inside the paddocks and cut for hay with machinery. Plus, um, the humidity in the in the in the air 
doesn't dry the, the grass too fast and I get rain every three, four days and, and, and the grass won't, won't, dry, won't dry off. So it's not an option to, to make hay in the, dry, in the rainy season. Quality hay, high quality hay. So you can make hay, hay in between quote, because it's dry grass, but it's really low quality grass, mature grass. So in my case, I don't, I don't like to put more cost to a low quality material. Yes, so I better go and, and, gra and graze it with the cows. I could uh, make some silage, but it's the same, the same thing, the same risk. And that's what I do. I, I, I graze my cows 365 days a year, 24 hours. And depending on the quality of the grass, I give us uh, some supplement for the, not for the cow, but for the rumen, basically. How does how do you manage during the rainy season? Uh, is there any concern about uh, damage to the paddocks when it's wet and and the ground is soft? Anything like that? Well, that's a that's a beautiful question because most people thinks about humid soil or too humid soil or, or damp soil as really a place where you shouldn't put animals in, right? But with rational grazing or high high density grazing. The density of grazing is a beautiful tool here. It works the same with dry grass. You need a high density to, to push the cow to eat everything or trample everything. And with um, humid, really humid soil, you need even more density to eat all that grass really fast and stay in the, the, the cows won't, uh, won't walk too much. So you will stay with the cows in the paddock in that specific place really short time. So the, the, the soil doesn't get too, too damaged and you can still graze in down to the bottom of the plant. How much uh, rest are you giving these paddocks during the rainy season? Well, we have a certain infrastructure to, in order to be able to, what we call to jump, to jump paddocks. We monitor the um, optimum grazing period, optimum resting period of the grass that is that maturity, maturity stage of the grass where you can graze it, eat it, uh, in, and you won't um, compromise the, the new regrowth. Yes, when his roots are full of reserves, you can eat it with no problem. So we, we, jump, we jump paddocks. We keep looking for the best paddock of the day. And for that, we have certain infrastructure, fixed infrastructure of, of electric fences to move the paddock freely uh, all around the place, looking for that ex um, excellent nutrition for them. Are you talking about like a lane or something that you can move them from one paddock to another paddock that isn't adjacent to that paddock? Is that, is that what you're referring yes, to? Yes, actually lots of lanes. Lots of lanes in the design of the, of the system. Imagine, as, as, uh, if, imagine that you're looking at um, urban development Yes, for houses and everything with lots of, of roads all, all around. Roads became the, the, the key part of, sorry, roads become the, the key part of, of this jumping, jumping strategy in rainy season, in rainy regions. Because if you have only one lane and you're going to be jumping, giving it a lot of traffic of cattle there, you're going to really damage it. And with the proper design, of lanes or, or roads around the paddocks, you will actually grace the lanes because you have the ability to administrate them better. What about water? I mean, you're getting a lot of water falling from the sky. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Is it? Does it stick around? Is it? Is are there? Are there ponds? Are there streams? What? What kind of uh, surface water? Well, are you I, guys have, I have. I have a. Uh, I have one stream crossing the ranch, almost in the middle. But I don't really like to use it because of the, my, my neighbors, the, the practices and, uh, that my neighbors do, they, they grow tomatoes, for example, with lots of chemicals and everything. So I don't want to get all those chemicals and problems into my cattle. So I mostly I use uh, water for the cattle, 
in 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 Ponce, the water I have in Ponce. My my dad uh, felt he has a he was a beaver like 25 years ago, and he made <laughs> lots of ponds in the ranch. So those are our our our, our main water supply for everything. And are you grazing around those in in different paddocks, or how how are you guys? Uh, is there a paddock per pond, or how are you guys uh, managing the grass that's closest to the pond versus the grass that's farther away from the pond? Some of those things. Um, like seven years ago, when we started with all these racial grazing thing, we closed the ponds. Yeah, so the cattle couldn't get into the pond and and uh, get the water dirty or whatever with parasites, dung, urine, whatever. So we closed the paddocks and we set up a um, water system with with uh, pipes and everything. So we could because our paddocks are so small. Yes, I developed, for example, now I have 140 half an hectare paddocks, and I have to make more. I have room for more. Um, and, here, and every paddock has water, has access to water with a, with a trout, a, a mobile trout, water trout. And so we set up a, a pipe system for water, and we, we pump from the, from, the, from the ponds to an elevated tank that distributes the water by gravity. If I'm understanding you correctly, you said half a hectare, right? Yes, half a hectare. Which is about 1.25 acres. Uh, there's about... Yes, yes, that's right. You're right. There's You're about right. two, and a half, two and a half acres per... I had to Google it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's about two and a half acres per hectare from yes. what I could see. Yes. So, or what, what are you running through there? You're running the whole herd through at once on that, on that land? Yes, the whole herd. Uh, actually, right now, I don't have enough cattle. Yes, I have only half the cattle that the ranch is asking me or is, is offering me to charge, to, to, to load there. So I need more cattle. What a problem, right? You're right. <laughs> Most people is looking for, it, for feed, for forage. Right. I, need, I need cattle. So um, now in the rainy season, I am using around no more than 25 hectares with all the cattle I have, yes. And the rest of the ranch, I'm going to make hay to, to sell it later and because it's going to, I have a, I have a, I have too much forage. So I'm going to buy, I want to sell hay and the rest of it, I, it's what I eat in the, well, not me, my cows. <laughs> what my cows eat in the dry season. What about the cattle themselves? What kind of cattle are you guys running? Oh, that's a beautiful question. We started uh, with, my dad started in the 80s with commercial cattle, basically Brahman crosses. Then he, he became a brown seas breeder. Yes, brown seas down here in the tropics, believe it or <laughs> not. Later on, when I, I took the ranch in, in 2003, in 2011, we started with, uh, with Wasan Rational Grazing. And in 2014, I realized I get to know what adaptation means and <laughs> what that adaptation means in cattle. And we arrived that, that uh, our brown Swiss had nothing to do here. Yes, that's what I, I, I knew. I, I thought before that every single cow would graze, dung, and produce. But no, there are some cows that only graze and dung. <laughs> and I had them all. <laughs> I had them all. I had them all. So we started a journey in in looking for adaptation and reading, and that's I, I learned all these these adaptation concepts with Johann Sitzman from Zimbabwe. I, I met him in Chihuahua, and I started the journey there with him in about the adaptation and functional efficiency of the cattle and all these different way of managing genetics. So now I am, I am moving from brown Swiss and brown V2, brown V2, to I first crossed them with, my, with Romo Sinuano. It's a Bostaurus breed from Colombia, tropical breed, criollo breed from Colombia, and for meat, for meat. 
So I started the, the first jump was with Romo Sinuano, and now I am crossing those Romo Sinuano heifers to a bull of the breed Mashona, that is tropical too. Is a, a, a beef beef uh, beef breed, tropical with high marbling and tenderness of the meat, um, early maturing, um, from middle to to small size of the of the cattle. Well, we're all involved in that now. What role does your climate play in the uh, ability of a cow to produce, as you said, um, more than just graze and dung? <laughs> <laughs> what, what role does the cow's uh, adaptation play in that ability to continue to pr- produce a calf year after year? I imagine that's what you're after, right? Cows that keep yes. producing year after year? Yes. Well, um, the difference is here... What, what you have up there mainly is uh, the high temperatures and humidity in most of the year and the nights. Well, where I am located is not really hard, though the, the temp- temperature in the nights because I am 800 meters above sea level. Hmm. Wow. So it gets not so, so warm and humid. But in the, in the coast of Chiapas or in the north of Chiapas, that they are in lower altitudes it gets really 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 hard for cattle hmm. and the other problem not problem but difference here that we have to address is that we have uh, what uh, Johann Sitzman calls low octane grasses <laughs> yes yes really we don't, our, our problem is not protein our problem is energy in the grasses hmm. we have lots of um, lignin in the grasses, that is, is not, uh, the cattle is not able to digest it. So, and, and they reach their maturity, well, they go, they go over mature really fast. Yes, mm. the window when they are really palatable and nutritive for the cattle is really short, really, really short. Yes, and it's, it's, these are grasses that have more water and they are less, less nutrient dense. Right, so we have to make cattle that can address that 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 can thrive with that fuel, right? And then we have uh, temperature, we have humidity, we have ticks, lots of ticks, lots mm. of um, flies, lots of um, many other parasites. That the, the 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 parasite pressure here is really really high. How how do you guys deal with the parasite pressure there? Adaptation, genetics, is beautiful. Mm. <laughs> genetics is, is, is the magic word here. Uh, before, when we had the, the brown Swiss, I almost, I, I think it was a better job, or not, not a job, it was a better business to me to put a veterinary, a veterinary pharmacy or drug for, yes, yeah. Because I, the, 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 the use of all medicines was amazing, 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 because the only way to address parasites and inefficiencies in the cattle with unadapted genetics is with uh, medicines and supplements and hormones and vitamins and everything. It is not, uh, not possible. Well, the cost rise to the ceiling, to, 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 the, to, the, to the sky, and, and you, you get out of business immediately so (laughs) i've talked to producers from northern uh saskatchewan to or northern alberta excuse me to pretty extreme southern mexico now (laughs) who have both told me the same thing yes that to deal with parasites to deal with uh issues in cattle it's adaptation to the climate the the, the the first and and the first uh, I believe the first, how do you say, approach and most effective approach is genetics. Yes. The second one is management, is, is the, the grazing management. You, you break cycles, you regenerate the, the soil, the ecosystem and everything. You put all the uh, trophic cascades all in balance again. Yes. You will have parasites, yes, but you won't have parasites as a as a economic risk 
that are, are risking your business because of the parasites. No, you won't have them. Very neat. So we we talked quite a bit about wet season. What what are you guys doing in the dry season? How does your management change from wet to dry? Well, the basic the the main change is that that I stop jumping paddocks. I I I continue. I just graze in a rotational order. To say that because all the all the grass is is old. It's it's too over mature. It's low quality, so it doesn't. It doesn't make ten, make sense to jump to jump paddocks. So I start grazing rotationally, not not rationally, rotationally in sequence, and I give the cows a, a protein supplement in order to them for, to to feed the the rumen and and, and, per, and so so they can perform with that low quality grass. What is the supplement you give? Well, now I, I'm I'm using a commercial one. Uh, based on with urea and, and, and soy. Uh, this next season, I'm going to try with, um, do you know mesquite? Okay. We, have, we don't have mesquite. We, we have a cousin of him. <laughs> so that gives uh, these little, little pots full of protein and energy too. So I'm going use, to use some of those, of those pots to, 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 to feed the cattle, to feed the rumen. And use some some urea. I'm trying to to lower the cost down because using these these uh, commercial products is really is quite expensive. And uh, so I'm that's what I'm gonna use this year, this next season. You talk about the difference between grazing rotationally and rationally, <laughs> uh, and I, I think that's a beautiful way of of describing it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, actually. It has to be ra- rational too in the dry season because we are using right. all the knowledge we have. We are using all the tools we have in order to to get the best of all the resources we have in the ranch without uh, damaging them, right? So um, basically, the the difference between rotational, as as it's as it uh, as as the term says. Is, is you, you make a single rotation with in order sequence one to two, two to three, three to four, and when you get to the sixty or forty five, forty fifth paddock, you go back to the first one without carrying the, the the maturity of the grass or or anything, right? You in rotational grazing, you graze a paddock with a time schedule, right? With a fixed time. You graze one day, half a day, two days, three days, five days, whatever. In rational grazing, no, you, you graze a paddock, the amount of time needed to graze it all down to the bottom of the plant, right? Hmm. If it's two hours, well, it's two hours. Go to the next <laughs> one. If it's two days, well, it's going to be two days. It's one day, it's going to be one day. It's half a day, it's going to be half a day. So uh, you pay it in rational grazing, you pay attention to all the resources, to all the resources is to, uh, is a must to know not everything to be an expert or every or whatever but to know the basics of physiology of animal animal nutrition animal ethology um, all those things in order to, to make the, the right decisions every single day and and this rational grazing is um, in the the lanes and the ability to jump paddocks are very important. Yes. In that, correct? <laughs> yes. And that is from the influence of Andre Voisin, is that correct? Yes. And Carlos Pinero? Yes. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about them? They don't get a lot of uh, mention in, in North American or, or in, uh, at least in my experience, in the continental United States, we don't talk a lot about them. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about them and their influence on on Latin American uh, agriculture? Sure, sure. Uh, actually, Voisin is is well is the basis of uh, holistic management of um, actually Johann Sitzman too is, is is the basics of all the the let's say the modern grazing systems or grazing techniques but certainly he doesn't to get uh, mentioned too much here in latin america it gets mentioned because it's in the name of the system <laughs> <laughs> his last name is in the name of the right. of the grazing system right so uh, 
but he was a French guy from Normandy. He got his dad ranch and he started doing, he was a chemist or biochemist or something. I don't remember his, his profession. But he started doing some research in grasses and 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 what he he has what he achieved and all the info he put together is amazing and the way he put it together and explains it is is beautiful his his books is a must read for everybody involved in cattle in the cattle business and grazing grazing business uh, he has he has six books i believe if i recall now yes his books six books the most important one is the, the grass productivity. Uh, he's the, the, that's the, the, the most important one. And the other one, beautiful one, is name is called Soil, Grass, and Cancer. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing book. It sounds like it's it. an opening job book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he he was in in Cuba in Cuba. When he passed away in the 63, I, th- I believe, 1963, 64, yes. And he was giving lectures and he passed away right before one conference. And I believe in that same year, uh, two, two, two guys from Brazil found his work and started developing, developing it in one each in, in their own region and not talking to each other, not knowing each other. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. One of them was Nilo Romero in Brazil. He was a, a cattle breeder, beef cattle breeder, and he started doing his, his work. He has a book too, I believe. Yes, I don't have it, but he has a book. And in the other side was uh, Luis Carlos Piñeiro. He was a dairy, dairy farmer hmm. and also a teacher in, 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 in a university in Brazil. So he started applying all his, all Bosan's knowledge legacy in his farm and start doing research in the university and that's where he there is where he when he develops all these let's say strategy or system how do you say the framework to develop a, a, a project to so so can so everyone can develop his own their own project in their own farm and and adapt it to he doesn't he doesn't put numbers, he doesn't give recipes, he doesn't give anything. He just talks about principles. And once you understand them, you can put them in your farm and get your own numbers, amount of paddocks, size of the paddocks, how many lanes, the, the width of the lanes, um, the dimension of the water system, to feed the, to, to, to water the cattle and all those numbers you you have to figure them out following these these basic principles hmm. yes that's a very very interesting history I, I appreciate that um i i think that's something that we would do well in the united states to take a little bit more of that influence uh of those of those individuals and i i'm, I'm sure at least some of those books are have been translated into english and, and yes and there were some books are translated in uh, into english i don't know if the six of them the, the six of them i have them in spanish mm-hmm. they must be in english for sure right um pinedo's books he has two books one is called The Dialectics of Agroecology. Is it, that's the second book. It's a beautiful book. Actually, one should read that one first than the, than the other. It's called uh, Vosan Rational Grazing. Hmm. Um, they are in, in Portuguese, of course, and in Spanish. I don't know if they are. I don't believe that they are translated into English. I had Fernando Falamir on yes. uh, episode eight of the Working Cows podcast, and he mentioned at least... A couple of those books, and I know I looked for them in English, and I couldn't find them as really? far as Pinero's books are concerned. No, Pinero, I, uh, I don't believe so, but I don't think right. so. But voice in for sure. Yeah, yeah Vazan, yes, those for are sure. in English. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, very, very good stuff. Well, I, I really appreciate your time today. It's been really just interesting, uh, different way of thinking uh, about 
or different, just a different region and getting, getting exposed to how you guys are, are meeting the challenges. Um, really encouraging to me that the way you meet the challenges is similar to the way other people, even in Canada are meeting the challenges with cattle adapted to the environment. And, uh, just really, really cool to see some of those core principles hold true from, from Mexico to Canada. And, uh, appreciate your time today any any resources this is workingcows.net slash 49 this is going to be episode 49 of the working cows podcast at workingcows.net slash 49 i'll link to the books that you've mentioned um anything else any other resources things that you would well i have a web page called uh, ganaderia regenerativa.com uh, regenerative ranching just to translate it ganaderia regenerativa.com and I have the Facebook page too, so there's when you can you can find me. Uh, just a uh, last last point or comment. A couple of years ago, three years ago, I was invited to Chihuahua with a group of friends when we have a regenerative management um, association, and they invited me to to give a, a conference. I said, "What what am I going to say? I'm going to tell to them in the north." I come from the from the tropics, but we I, I spent um, I spent two days in one of the ranch that is is leading is leading the, the the regenerative management there. It's called Rancho Carretas, administrated by Servando Diaz, and I spent a couple of days there. And of course, the vegetation, the weather, the even the topography is, is different. Everything is different. But what amazed me is that the principles, as you said, the, the, the core principles that lead or define the, the, the management strategies are the same, exactly the same with the same effects. Hmm. The only thing that changes is times, recovery times, basically. Hmm. Recovery times and right. reserves needed for, for the dry season because I have this, I know that every single year, in June, I will get rain. I don't know how much, but I will get rain. Up there in Chihuahua, they don't know if it's going to rain this year, right? So they need to have a, a bigger buffer, let's say that way, to, to of buffer of, of, of grass to feed the cattle in case that it doesn't rain that year. But then it's exactly the same. The same with genetics, mm -hmm. the same with, the, with management. When Fernando was on, he said that, just to put this in perspective for American listeners, he said that if Arizona and Montana had a baby, it would be like his region in Mexico. And I want to put it, if I can, <laughs> put it in perspective for for American listeners, for, for Chiapas, if, if uh, Montana and Louisiana had a baby, it sounds like it would be similar to Chiapas with very wet but very high. Maybe... Should be Florida in the mix, maybe. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. I had a one one friend of mine who we were talking about ranching in the southwest, southeast of southeast, the United yes. States, where it's very very wet. Yes. And he he described the grass as tall water. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's it's, it's another of an, another kind of 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 bottled water. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a different kind of bottle. Just that's it. Yes. Yeah. Can you talk to me about your work with uh, the regenerative livestock website? I won't try to pronounce it in Spanish, but... Uh, <laughs> Ganadería Regenerativa. Yeah, that sounds better when you do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it started, it started a couple of years ago. Uh, I, I've been involved with all this uh, teaching and, and consulting in, in, in rational grazing. And a friend of mine told me, a friend from Costa Rica told me, hey, it's, it's the time you put a, a website or something. I asked him, I, I told him, hey, I don't know how to do that. I have a clue. You talk to me about cows. That's it. He knew something about websites and all the stuff. He ran a, a fast research and he told me, well, I asked him uh, what the name should be. We tried Pastoreo Racional Boazán, Racional Grazing in Spanish, and it was already taken. So, damn. <laughs> <laughs> that couldn't be. So he tried uh, Ganadería Regenerativa and it wasn't taken. So that's it. Then uh, I started, I, I like to write, I like to write and, and put, put things uh, simple. Yes, mm -hmm. not in a, in a scientific language or anything. I don't like it. 
because it has, it's, I, I believe it's information that has, that has to reach every single farmer. The one that has two cows and the one that has 500, 5,000 cows. So it has to be, or, or the one that has lots of studies and the other one that has not a single study or education in, in the school, right? So I like to put info reachable and in a really, really, really simple way. And that's what I'm doing with that uh, website. So you had a friend from Costa Rica who put you on the spot, said you need to start a website. You got a friend from South Dakota who's putting you on the spot saying you need to start a <laughs> podcast. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, don't, don't, uh, that's, that's uh, something that has been giving me itches, let's say that in the, in well, you've got the audience already and that's a huge part of it. You know, I started with zero <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and you've got, you've got that Facebook following built up and the, and the visitors to the website built up. So yes. you, you've got, you've got the hardest part done. Honestly, the easy part is, is sitting down and recording and, and talking and, uh, you're very, very good at it. You put it in simple terms, even with a language barrier, you, you communicated beautifully. So, uh, I really, I look forward to that. Uh, <laughs> I, I will learn, I will, I will brush up on my Spanish just so I can listen. <laughs> yeah. And you have to rush out on your Spanish and in order to come here and, and see what is happening here. You're more than welcome whenever you want. Yeah. No, it's it's one of my wife and I's dream for the Working Cows podcast is that we'd be able to travel to some of these places we've been talking yeah. to people in and and learn from them and, and see what they're doing there. So I have a, a lady who teaches Spanish in um, Veracruz. She teaches English in Veracruz, uh -huh. and she's a member of my church here in South Dakota, okay. and she travels back and forth. She spent six months there oh, and six really? months here. Yep. And so she was my Spanish teacher oh, in okay. high school, and now she is teaching she English. is teaching English in Veracruz, yeah. so, uh, which is just north of you, if I'm, yes, if I'm Veracruz understanding. In, my... If she's in, in Veracruz, the city, she's like seven hours driving from here. Okay. All highway, beautiful highway. It's really mm. easy to get here. Well, Daniel, thank you for your generosity with your time today. I really appreciate it. And we'll, we'll like I said, we'll throw up some links at uh, workingcows.net slash 49. Um, I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. We'll see you around. Very good discussion there with Daniel Suarez. Really appreciate him uh, and all of his encouragement over the years and, and or over the months, I guess. We're just coming up on a one-year anniversary here. But uh, all of his encouragement uh, throughout these uh, last months and, and just his resources that he sent me, sent my way and, and setting up interviews and, and different things like that with different people. So uh, really appreciate Daniel. Coming up next week, episode 50. Uh, so excited for that interview and to to share it with you. It's a great guest, and I know that you guys are really going to enjoy just some of the different perspectives on a range of topics that we are going to discuss with our special guest for episode 50 of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week. <laughs>